Hi, I'm Rich with Off Grid Dogs Training and Behavior, Tampa, Florida. I'm crazy. I'm crazy about you because you love your dog. And uh, I want to help you get your dog off the grid, out of the matrix, resist the pet industrial complex. Uh, yes, there is a pet industrial complex. That's what this video is about. I want to expose some problems that we have uh, that make uh, things hard on our dogs. Uh, I'd like to dedicate this video to uh, what inspires me to open off-grid dogs, to uh, advocate for dogs and fight the pet industrial complex. And that's uh, my wife, Manu, who is a true animal whisperer. Uh, she's one of those rare people that just have unbelievable relationships with animals. And I've learned a lot from her. And also our dog, Taboo. Today's his birthday. He's six years old today. Uh, we've had Taboo, the Great Pyrenees, for, since he was seven weeks, and it's been a great six years for us, and hopefully for him as well. And uh, all the other animals that I've had throughout my life, dogs and cats, uh, horses when I was younger. And uh, yeah, um, this is mostly going to be recorded because I'm old and senile, and I don't want to screw it up. So i am divided it into five brief sections about the pet industrial complex. Um, the first one, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the problems that I've identified that made me motivated to uh, talk about this. So let's get started. In the U.S., we kill millions of dogs and cats annually and have been for decades. The shelter system is broken and in many cases unethical, but making lots of money. So-called no-kill shelters are allowed to kill up to 10% of their dogs and still keep that misleading and false designation. But shelters aren't the only ones killing dogs. Veterinarians are killing more dogs than ever before. Due to the ridiculous amount of preventable health issues our dogs are experiencing and the unaffordability of treatment, many uh, pet owners uh, have to resort to letting the vet uh, put their animal down. I can't walk my dog through any neighborhood in this country without seeing at least 80% of the dogs we meet are very insecure, anxious, fearful, frustrated, you know, out of control, psychotic, just obviously not having a good relationship with their owner and not leading a fulfilled life. And usually the human is clueless. These tens of millions of unhappy dogs are sadder to me than the millions that we kill. There is a pet industrial complex in this country that causes behavior problems and health issues for dogs and frustrates pet owners. Misleading dog trainers, ruthless pet food companies, along with veterinarians, shelters, and breeders based on profit instead of what is good for your dog. I started off-grid dogs training and behavior to inform pet owners and counter the narrative of this $70 billion a year pet industrial complex, because obviously this is not working well for average pet owners and their dogs. We need to inform them of a better way. Okay. Um, so this next section um, is a brief uh, talk about dog training. I'm a dog trainer, so this is uh, near to my heart. And um, I've studied all the various types of dog training, and it's uh, been real interesting lately. So uh, let's move on to that. So many dogs are having behavior problems because... When their owners go to dog trainers for help, they get misled by both ends of the current spectrum of dog training. Basically, there is more money to be made telling owners what they want to hear instead of what they need to know. The biggest lie of the pet industrial complex is convenience. When someone starts selling you convenience as regards to dogs, get skeptical and run the other way. Dogs are not convenient. A dog is unexplainably awesome if you have a great relationship, but they are not convenient. 
The dog training world is currently divided into two camps. The force free or positive only reinforcement only trainers appeal to people who understand nothing about dogs and believe you don't need to provide structure and discipline and leadership, which of course dogs not only need, but crave and thrive on. So dog owners are misled into having poor relationships with their dogs, leading to insecure, fearful, badly behaved, and sometimes dangerous dogs, all in the pretense of being morally superior to cruel and evil punishment trainers. The other side of the divide in dog training, the balance trainers, referring to those trainers who don't uh, claim to be positive only or who use all four quadrants uh, and use corrections, also often are misleading their clients by making the easy sales pitch that they can fix your dog's behavior problems by training the dog when they should make the more difficult sales pitch and therefore uh, less profitable, but correct recommendation that it's the human that needs the most training. Ha, good luck selling that. Dog trainers are making six figures and even seven figures if they have assistant trainers by selling what's easy to sell, convenience. It sounds good to dog owners who don't know better. Many of these uh, trainers overuse and incorrectly use shock collars to suppress unwanted behavior and convince their client that the problem is now fixed or that the dog is now trained. And by the way, they will end up getting this valuable tool banned as they already have in other countries. These trainers favorite biggest money-making product is the board and train. How does giving your dog away to a stranger for a month and paying him $4,000 to train your dog, improve your relationship with your dog. Spending the majority of the training time on the dog makes no sense when these same trainers, if being candid, will admit it's the pet owner, not the dog, that needs the training. It's the human dog relationship, not obedience training, that solves most behavior problems. As dog trainers, we need to educate our clients instead of scamming them. We need to tell them what they need to know instead of what they want to hear. Okay, so um, next I want to talk a little bit about uh, big dog food. Um, let's get into that one. We've got to feed them something. Big dog food is the head of the snake of the PIC, the pet industrial complex. A very few huge corporations, Mars, Nestle, Colgate, Palmolive, own all of the dog food brands you are familiar with in the chain stores. A monopoly, really. Thanks to their lobbying power, pet food is not even regulated by the government. They self-regulate and make up their own labeling rules, which are a big con. Everything about kibble is wrong for dogs. What is allowed to go into it is disgusting, but even disregarding that, you couldn't come up with a worse product. Dogs' digestive systems were never meant to eat anything cooked. Kibble is cooked at such a high heat, all the nutrients are cooked out of it. So to claim good ingredients on their packaging, they have to spray synthetic vitamins and minerals after the high heat. However, this synthetic nutrition is very unhealthy for dogs, causing allergies and cancers and not giving a proper nutritional benefit. Much of the nutrition is defecated out before the dog can even digest it. Dogs are carnivores and are not meant to eat carbs. Rice, wheat, corn, and potatoes are used by big dog food as cheap fillers and a kind of cement to glue the stuff together so they can cut it into small pieces. These carbs make dogs hungry all the time so they overeat. Since their digestive system was not designed to handle carbs, it overworks uh, 
the stomach and cause leaky causes a leaky gut by wearing out the stomach lining. These carbs turn to sugar that fuel free radicals causing cancers. This food is bad for a dog's gut health, which weakens his immune system. Naturally, dogs were meant to get a lot of their hydration from their food. They get none from kibble. Also, dogs on kibble need to have their anal glands expressed by groomers because their poop is too soft to, to do it naturally. Behavior problems occur because when a dog feels sick all the time, it causes a lot of stress. And that promotes bad health and bad behavior. Shortens the lifespan, increases the vet bills. Important to know that spending more money on more expensive kibble makes little difference. Also, um, you know, canned food or wet food is not much better. To summarize, major brands of dog food will make your dog sick, cause bad behavior, and cost you huge vet bills. I highly recommend a documentary you can watch for free uh, called Pet Fooled. You can Google it and watch it. Uh, it's called Pet Fooled, like you've been fooled. Um, the good news is that even a slight improvement in a dog's diet can make a big difference. The best possible diet um, for a dog is a raw balanced, uh, varied, species specific diet, which I highly recommend if you are capable. Most will not be able or willing, and it has to be done correctly for the dog to thrive. But there are many great alternatives that most people could do. Dr. Karen Becker is a vet that promotes different uh, options for people's dogs, and you can find her on YouTube, um, that are easier, cheaper, and more realistic for the average pet owner. If you are interested in raw feeding, one of the best resources is Dogs Naturally by Dana Scott. And I will be uh, hosting a weekly podcast in the near future uh, with my wife, who's uh, been researching this for many, many years uh, for our dogs, and I uh, uh, hope you'll join us there. Uh, mom and pop pet stores are starting to carry healthier, fresher alternatives uh, as the demand grows, as people realize they need to avoid a big dog food. So let's do that for the sake of our dogs and ourselves. Let's uh, avoid allergies, uh, cancer, bad behavior, overweight dogs, and huge vet bills. Let's avoid big dog food. So that was Dr. Karen Becker, if you didn't catch that uh, on YouTube, that can provide lots of alternatives uh, without going to the extreme that my wife goes to with a raw balanced diet. Um, and that's uh, Dana Scott. If you are going to try to go raw, you got to do it right. Uh, Dana Scott on uh, Dogs Naturally is a good a good place to look. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention in there about um, an advantage to not feeding kibble. Um, it's a lot easier to pick up your dog's poop when he's eating uh, the good stuff, when he's eating raw bones. Um, not only does it express the anal glands, but it's very firm. So it's like picking up uh, a rock or a piece of kibble a lot of the time if you've been giving them enough uh, raw bones to eat. So uh, just a lot better than, you know, picking up uh, what they squirt out when they eat kibble all the time. Um, sorry about that, but <laughs> it's true. Um, so uh, next thing we're going to talk about is veterinarians. Oh, and this seems like a good time to throw out a disclaimer since I probably didn't yet, just to keep my attorney happy um, in case somebody actually watches this. Um, I'm obviously not a, uh, a veterinarian or a nutritionist or a scientist or any of that stuff. So uh, this is just opinions. Uh, do your own research. It's easy to do. There's a lot of good stuff out there, uh, including some of the sources I mentioned that, that pet fooled documentary. You'll never look at a, a pet store the same way again when you walk into one of those big chain pet stores with all those uh, brands of dog food that are no good. Um, yeah, so let's... Uh, Go to veterinarians now.
Many veterinarians do not deserve your respect or your business. Veterinarians cherry pick science to pad their wallets. Those two statements were made by two of the uh, most distinguished and respected uh, dog people around. Uh, the first was made by Ed Frawley, uh, the owner of Learberg, uh, the oldest and biggest uh, dog training website on the internet. And uh, the second statement was made by uh, a local guy who just moved here recently, Ivan Balbanov. Uh, Ivan's uh, arguably been said to be the best dog trainer in the world. Um, and he's living right here in the Tampa Bay area now. Welcome, Ivan. Uh, he's won two world championships and 15 national championships in IGP. Uh, and has really dominated uh, that uh, competition for like 30 years. So uh, why did they say that about veterinarians? Well, um, it's not a big surprise uh, that they seem ignorant veterinarians do of dog nutrition, given who funds the veterinarian schools, big dog food. Also, uh, many vet uh, practices are being bought up by huge corporations where the bottom line is all that matters. So, um, you know, you have to kind of follow the money. Veterinarians apparently know as little about dog behavior as most of their clients. Um, it's not surprising for me anymore when I walk into a veterinary clinic and I see the vet techs, the people who work there, even the veterinarian himself uh, acting all excited uh, to see my dog, you know, very unprofessional. Uh, they should be calm uh, around a dog they don't know that they're getting ready to try to work on. Uh, but I guess they want to convince me that, you know, they love my dog or something. Um, so I'll spend more money. I don't know. It's ridiculous. But um, anyway, not very professional. Um, of course, this is... Uh, not a big part of their curriculum, uh, dog behavior that is. If they covered it all, it's very briefly covered in their schools. And if they understood dogs, they probably wouldn't um, prescribe psychotropic drugs that don't work, um, you know, Ritalin, Prozac, uh, for dogs with no real issue other than not having a, a good relationship with their owner, uh, having an owner that doesn't know how to uh, live with a dog. But hey, it's money. Uh, veterinarians have been guilty of over-vaccinating dogs for at least 20 years. Um, and I'm not against vaccinations at all. My dog is certainly vaccinated with the core vaccines, not all the uh, extra BS, but, uh, you know, the, the, the core important vaccines. The issue is he doesn't need them over and over and over again. Uh, check out what a titer test is. And uh, it's very inexpensive blood test to see if your dog's uh, still protected uh, with the antibodies that he needs. So you don't need to get uh, more vac vaccinations because over vaccinating a dog is very detrimental and can have uh, extreme side effects. Um, but uh, veterinarians don't like to talk about that. Um, if a vet would neuter your dog to calm the dog or to change his behavior problems, um, go to go somewhere else. Uh, to me, that's an unethical vet because neutering a dog does not stop it from being aggressive. It doesn't calm the dog down necessarily. It doesn't uh, stop him from humping necessarily. Um, these are all issues that a good dog trainer can help you with. Uh, you don't have to castrate your dog and ruin his health um, because, um, you know, some vet is unethical or ignorant uh, of dog behavior. Um, most of the dogs that I have uh, dealt with that were aggressive were neutered. You know, <laughs> my intact male Great Pyrenees is not aggressive at all, and he's intact. Um, if a vet would neuter your dog 
to um, prevent overpopulation, um, you know, or the shelter system likes to do that. I would argue that maybe that was a good idea 50 years ago when everybody's dog ran free, but we're not living in that world anymore. And uh, as far as I know, dogs are not allowed to run free. And if you're a dog owner and you can't decide who your dog breeds with, if it breeds at all, you probably shouldn't be a dog owner. So I think that's a ridiculous reason to neuter a dog. Uh, my dog is six years old and he, he's never bred with anybody and he's never going to breed with anybody, but he's quite happy to be intact. Um, and then if a, if a veterinarian would neuter a dog before its skeleton is finished growing, he's certainly unethical. Um, because he's got to know better. Uh, the dog needs its hormones to control its skeleton growth and tell it when to stop growing. So if you neuter a dog before it's two or three years old, uh, you're dooming that dog to poor health and, and you're gonna have huge vet bills when he has problems with his joints and elbows and every, knees and everything else. Um, so yeah, don't do that. Um, that's ridiculous. And by the time he's two or three years old, you'll realize, hey, my dog's fine. I don't need the nigger. <laughs> I can just keep him the way nature made him. If your veterinarian would declaw a cat, and I hate to get off on a tangent of cats, but uh, I, I was never a cat person until about 25 years ago when I got married and uh, we got uh, a couple of cats. And uh, I'm a cat person now, I'm telling you. But to declaw a cat, is extremely unethical. There is no reason to ever declaw a cat. It's ridiculous. Um, nobody would do that that understands even what that in, entails and how it destroys a cat's personality. You could you could kill the cat, you know, which would be more humane than declawing it. But don't declaw it, please. Um, there's no reason to. Give it a scratching post, and it's fine. One of the worst examples of bad advice from vets is the way they um, sometimes, not every veterinarian, of course, uh, hopefully uh, does this, but I've had uh, several cases where vets recommend that you keep your puppy at home until he's fully vaccinated at four months old. Um, you know, your puppy comes from the mom with good uh, immune uh, uh, qualities, you know, he's got uh, from her mother's milk, he's got a lot of immunity until he's about 10 weeks old and then you start getting the vaccines and there is some risk in, uh, taking him out of the house and into public before he's four months old, but guess what? If you listen to that veterinarian and you keep your dog in the house or around your house until he's four months old, you're guaranteeing an unsocialized dog a fearful, anxious, insecure dog that will um, never really recover from not being socialized because that's the period when his brain is imprinting and you can never get that time back. So don't listen to a vet that says that um, you'll end up with a insecure, possibly dangerous dog. So, um, you know, not, uh, all vets are in this category, but um, the ones that are, shame on them. Uh, I'm currently looking for a good vet, so wish me good luck. But um, thanks for listening. Uh, one thing I meant to mention and forgot to, because like I said, I am senile. Um, probably the, the most important thing I wanted to cover in the vet section was... Um, a lot of people get scared into castrating their male dog with the, uh, the scare tactic of testicular cancer. So if your vet tells you, oh, you need to neuter your dog so he doesn't get testicular cancer, ask him this question. Um, yes, of course, it's true that if you castrate him, he's not going to get testicular cancer because he won't have testicles. But ask him what, what is the um, um, prevalence of that or, or what's the odds that he's going to actually get it because it's actually pretty rare. It's also uh, quite treatable 
as compared to all the other cancers he will more likely get because he was neutered. So if you do a little research, again, don't take my word for anything. It's easy to research this stuff. Um, there are some good vets out there that are off the grid and telling the truth. Um, there's a lot of cancers that are much worse than testicular cancer, much less treatable, much more of a death sentence when your dog gets, say, bone cancer, for example, um, that they tend to get when they've been neutered uh, at a much higher rate. So it's not even close. It's a, it's a very uh, easy decision for me once I've got more of the facts that uh, I don't want my dog neutered uh, for any reason. So that's my opinion. So let's move on to, I think we're gonna go talk about, um, who's next? I think we're gonna talk about um, shelters. Let's see what the shelters are up to. I am sure that there are many good people that work at shelters and that care about dogs. However, it's not ethical to mislead people about a dog's temperament and history just to promote an adoption to someone not capable of handling that particular dog, uh, maybe an aggressive dog, for example. It's extremely unethical to require puppies to be neutered and young dogs to be neutered before their skeleton is finished growing. Uh, a lot of dogs get euthanized because many shelters do not allow good training. They're following the force free only fad, and that uh, would, you know, does not allow a more difficult dog to have a chance at a life where a great trainer uh, might have been able to, to help in that situation. Uh, virtue signaling doesn't help dogs. And speaking of virtue signaling, why would a shelter that's, you know, wanting your donations, because they supposedly need money, and uh, they're killing dogs because they're overcrowded, so they're, you know, they're killing, euthanizing dogs, and yet they're going to China and purchasing meat dogs from China that they can uh, sell to some Karen so she can brag about uh, how she's more virtuous than her friends on Facebook who just adopted a regular shelter dog when she adopted a meat dog from China, from the meat market. That's a ridiculous uh, waste of, um, of money. Um, but when you think about it, uh, these shelters are an important part of the PIC, the pet industrial complex, because without them, uh, people wouldn't have a convenient place to get rid of their dogs. You know, it, it'd be harder for them just to try one out for a few weeks and decide, oh, no, nah, it's not working for me. I think I'll just drop it off at the shelter. Um, maybe they take getting a dog more seriously, but it seems like the pet industrial complex wants people to think that everyone should have a dog and everyone can have a dog, it's so easy. Um, yeah, I've heard many people say over the years that the shelter system is broken, but I'm more cynical. I'm afraid it's just the way they want it to be, making lots of money. Okay, next we have pet stores where you should never buy a puppy and puppy mills. The most important time you'll ever spend with your dog is before you get it. Should you even get one? What breed? And most importantly, from where? A puppy mill? This just illustrates the level of ignorance our dogs are up against. I can't believe that 30 years ago, we knew not to buy puppies from pet stores. How are these places still open? There are two that I know of right here in the Tampa Bay area, and at least one is a chain with several locations throughout Florida. Talk about an unethical way to make lots of money they sell their horrible quality puppies for six and seven thousand dollars and more. 
These puppies are genetic nightmares with huge health and mental stability issues. Ethical breeders go to great lengths to breed for mental stability and good health. Puppy mills are not ethical. When you buy one of these puppies, you are supporting dog torture. The breeding parents are kept in wire cages their entire lives, standing on wire floors with bleeding paws, having one litter after another until they are used up and then discarded, often sold for dog food. That's right, that's where some of the protein in your kibble comes from. Yet these pet stores stay open year after year, generating horror story after horror story. Read the reviews, the real reviews, all the five-star reviews are day of purchase to get a $200 discount. You can tell when you read them that they're, they're fake reviews. But when you read the Yelp reviews, the real reviews, after they've had the puppy for a few weeks, then you get this, the real story and it's not good. Why does this never change? Where are all these wonderful organizations we're supposed to donate money to? Where's PETA, the SPCA, the AKC, the Humane Society? What are they doing? Do they really want anything to change? Obviously not. There's too much money. The pet industrial complex makes 70 billion a year selling convenience that having a dog is easy and everyone should have one. The truth is most people are not capable of giving a dog a fulfilling life, but they're being lied to and don't even realize how poor their dog's life is. Okay, thanks for letting me get that off my chest. It's been building for years, but uh, I'm hoping to get uh, information out um, because it's just a lack of information. I, I don't feel like the average pet owner is uh, aware of all this stuff. I think they're pretty oblivious to it, which is the way the pet industrial complex likes it because when you become informed, you know, you might take action, you might do something different. You might avoid big dog food and avoid all this extra stuff the vet's trying to sell. Um, our plan is to have a very natural, healthy uh, dog, and it's working great so far. He's having his sixth birthday. He's a giant breed, so they're not supposed to live very long, but we're hoping that uh, because of his diet, he's gonna live a lot longer than uh, you know the, the average. Um, but uh, it's working well so far. I mean, um, if your dog is getting the exercise and the, um, you know, the life fulfillment. He's getting to use his brain a little bit and he's, he's getting to be with you a lot, not being left alone. And he's, you know, doing breed specific stuff, but um, mainly and, uh, and having a healthy diet, even if it's not a raw diet, but something better than kibble. Um, you know, that's uh, gonna be a dog that uh, you're gonna enjoy living with and uh, uh, he's going to have a great life. So um, thanks again to my wife, Manu, for inspiring me and for my dog, Taboo. Happy birthday, Taboo. He's six today. And uh, we'll talk to you soon.